नमस्ते स्वर्णा वेलकम नमस्ते रजनी थैंक यू सो मच फॉर हैविंग मी अरे थैंक यू फॉर मेकिंग द टाइम ऑनर्ड आई हैव बीन सीइंग द अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन videos and feeling like wow look at all these people and you called me to be on this series and i actually feel very very good about it lovely but it's it, the honor is uh, of the platforms and of the amazing work you do um, so so what i like with everyone else what is your earliest recollection of either the concept that is the idea or the experience of uh, non violence any familiarity with it it could be from your childhood you know i was um, raised in a family of freedom fighters congressies so very early in our vocabulary you know words like satyagraha ahimsa gandhi ji of course you know looming large in these stories my mother and her sisters were among a very large group of cousins Uh, who were growing up with older cousins who were in and out of jail during the quit india movement so this this uh, this inherited well their stories were the stories i grew up with as much as stories from the ramayana and so on you know, the usual indian stories but also the stories of uh, people about you know gandhi ji speaking about non violence and having a non violent struggle and wearing only khadi and everybody in a madras family learning hindi so this is sort of where the word first entered my consciousness as far as i can remember so in a sense i inherited from my family india non violence uh, the i idea of satyagraha which i don't fully understand even now but i'm completely fascinated by in many ways so i would say it's that but then a second layer would be that my mother was uh my mother was an international relations student before it was a subject so you know she was doing her masters in the nehru era and the bandung era so those were also my stories in my childhood Mm-hmm. and um again words like peace non violence um into the vocabulary the sense that there should be world peace without you before you know what the world is what peace is but that this is like what am i going to do when i grow up i'm going to make world peace <laughs> um so just elements of this just reinforced one day yeah. after another then getting a chance to go to the un and seeing something like world peace in process you know here's a place where world peace can happen so just all of that together and it just seems correct you know yeah it's yeah. just like this you know this is the right value this is the right way yeah. so i can't actually explain it beyond that no no that's uh, that's very rich uh, did this I, or rather i'm sure it did a uh, shape your grown up life as a professional as a scholar as an academic uh, mm-hmm. uh, how how what did it do in to you as as a professional and how did that leave you to pragna i mean so, to found you know to there, found is, pragna. there is a way in which we narrate our lives where life moves in a linear bullet train fashion and there is the way in which we live our lives which is completely zigzag aage peeche gol gol you know so in both of those journeys which happen simultaneously and perhaps in dialogue with each other this is sort of where i have been headed so early in my life i knew i wanted to study politics i wanted to study when i discovered the term i wanted to do international relations i wanted to be a diplomat i wanted to mediate between fighting people so all of my choices small things you know uh leaving i went to safaya right after school for my plus 2 
And uh, in junior college, I left after June. I went to Sophia because it had a great college magazine that I wanted to edit. But I left Sophia because I couldn't study political science and I moved to Elphinstone. So every single choice along the way for me, every opportunity I sought, I had pen friends from the age of 11, you know, and I, I wrote off to agencies and said, I wanted, you know, I want to write to a young person from your country. But there's actually another story there, which I maybe we could talk about another day. Um, but anyway, I had a lot of pen friends, many of whom I still keep, been four decades plus, plus, plus. Um, also because of a conviction that if children write to each other, bridges will be built. And this is from the age of 11. So we built these bridges and we built family relationships. And uh, for me, this is of all the ways in which you build, you make the world better. You do it through friendship. So, um, yeah. you know, just in every way, it, it's all one, it's, it's one person's journey. So it is, it is all related. And um, so then studying international relations, getting to intern at the UN. Then I came back and then I had a, a meandering period of sorts. I did a variety of different things before going back for a doctorate. And in that time, I got to meet a lot of people who were working in the social, in what we now call the social sector, but they were working in development organizations. I had a chance from the time I was in college because of my cousins to be uh, not a foot soldier, but let's say a, a candle carrier and a collection box carrier in the women's movement in the early 80s in Bombay. And um, also then to work in think tanks and to be part of track two initiatives. And I'm coming to the Prajnia part because I did all these things and I found that all of the pieces that make up peace um, were being addressed in different ways. And yet there were things that were falling between the cracks uh, in the security studies work that I trained to do, and I continue to be and identify as a security studies scholar as well. Um, you know, nobody's talking about people's lives, but that is the ultimate unit of security. You know, if a person is not safe in their life, then what is all my grand doctrine about? So just these bits that did not fit to Together, I began to envision a space that would address them. Prajna kind of came out of that need to create or facilitate a space where people could join the dots that are not being joined, uh, forge the connections that they need to connect. Um, explore in the languages that yeah. they need to. Uh, for the benefit of non-Hindi, non-Sanskrit uh, listeners, uh, Swarna, can you please explain the word, why you chose this word, Prajna? Uh, this word as... that I can't pronounce consistently. Yes, Pragna, Pragya, Pradnya, uh, and the way we say it because of the URL spelling, Prajnya. Mm -hmm. So um, when I decided that I wanted to do this around uh, Jan, Feb, 2003, I was looking for a word. I mean, words are very important no, to all of us. So I went to a variety of Sanskrit dictionaries and just because, I mean, people in Tamil Nadu also say, why Sanskrit? But, you know, I want to say Prajnya is also used in Tamil as pragya, because Tamil has a lot of loan words. Indian languages have borrowed from each other over time. So uh, I was looking for a word that would uh, remind us of some sort of depth, um, 
And you know, a Hindi word that I love is Tera. This rush, we were only, it was 2003, four, but already we were at the age where, you know, something happens at 10 o'clock and by 10, 15, you have experts writing on it. How is it possible to have, to grasp what is going on in the world and have an instant opinion? So to remind whatever it is that the space was going to be, I wanted a name that would be a reminder to do long haul work, to do deep work, to do quiet work, to do slow work, you know, to not be tempted into um, quickly coming up with something, you know, catching the, uh, the, the, the closest storm or for that matter, whatever is the new funding trend. So I think just, I just wanted a name that would remind us, and you know, in, um, uh, in Buddhism, the word in Pragna is also the Pragna Paramita Sutra, the idea of going beyond and I have very little understanding of it, but within that understanding, the idea of not stopping at what is immediately accessible, immediately comprehensible, but being able to go beyond that to what lies beneath and beyond and behind. I think I just wanted a name that will always lead us there. Bahut cool. Lovely. Lovely. So how has it been in this now almost you're almost close to your 20th anniversary? 15. Looking, 15. Uh, you said 2003, 15, right? 15 actually. 2003 I started to write the notes so then I came oh. down what I keep flashing before the before my team is vision document and then I came back to India and it took me another four years so we actually mark 2007. Mm. as our starting point so we're going to be oh. 15 but you're right the vision is almost 20 years old and yeah. I hadn't even thought about that yeah yeah so can you give an it's... overall a kind of a you know a brief overview of the many ways in which you have put these values just now you know what you articulated about the importance of uh, still and slow and deeper seeking how has this uh, because actually and you know this has been widely said speed may be the most pervasive form of violence in our times Probably, at, least, yeah. ex, uh, at least speed as an excessive rush yes yes so that and also yes. i know that a lot of your work has been focused on the gender dimension um, mm -hmm. so what are some of the ways in which this has unfolded so, you know, there's no point having a vision that is not ambitious. So when I wrote the document in 2003, in my study, I wrote, 10, I wrote about 10 intervention areas that we were going to work in on what would someday be like a 50, 100, whatever eco campus with places for people to meditate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but very practically decided to start working in two areas where I had some familiarity, um, some friends, people who would give me the time of day. And those two were um, gender equality and peace, uh, which I then cast the gender equality work originally as documentation of women's work in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as I you know, come from this family where women were in and out of jail, wearing khadi, making personal political, professional choices that had public, um, that reflected public history and that contributed to the making of a particular moment, even if they were not famous. So that sense that these lives needed documentation, then coming into the work as a political scientist and finding that if I wanted to write a paper on women in parliament or women in the Maharashtra legislature, access to numbers, becomes hard. I mean, now it's different. Now there's more and more data in the world, but 20 years ago, this was not the case. So it began with a vision to document, but when you do document women's work in the public sphere, you have to talk about limiting conditions. Why don't women work more? Mm. 
what deters them, and that big factor is violence. So then we began doing gender violence awareness work. So this is one part of the work. The heart of Pragnya's work, and I say this, and I've said this in 15 years, even at times when the Peace Education Initiative has been um, dormant to comatose, actually the Peace Education work. This is who we are. This is our heart. And the gender work is important. It's pivotal because gender equality, equality and justice are central to peace. You cannot have a peaceful society that is hierarchical, unequal, full of discrimination, all of which create impunity for violence. It's just not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't see, I, I, they sit in two file cabinets, so to speak, mm. but they belong to the same journey. Yeah, they are part of exactly the same work. And so the peace education work has been, um, we've tried it in a variety of ways. We tried to work in schools and uh, we tried to work with curriculum. There were some challenges with that. So we've now started working with what is easy because I think you, do, you just have to do the work. You can't wait for what is ideal work or yeah. desirable work or the work you first plan. And so we now do courses and lecture series and so and the blog. So I is think there a particular age focus? Be... Sorry, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is there a particular age focus? When we were when you know the um, in the first years of the peace education program, my co-creator is a Montessori educator. And so with her, then, you know, and I'm also someone who loves being in the classroom. So our accent, our focus was on children, on classrooms, on teaching teachers how to be peace educators, on um, engaging. We wanted to engage with parents and school administrations and uh, curriculum and so on. That, there, as I said, there were many challenges in that work. Um, I will not say we don't do that work. We aspire to do that work. We will do that work someday. But for the moment, it's um, on the back burner because it, it and I just, so let me also say what the challenge is. The challenge really was being able to raise enough money to, uh, when people like us don't like to talk about it, but money is important because if I want peace educators to go out to schools, they need to go to schools when schools are running from mm. nine to three. Yeah. That means I need to employ them from nine to three. They cannot be doing this as a hobby while they have a day job. They need to be earning enough to live. I mean, the first element of peace would be that my peace educators at Prashnya are able to live a decent life. Yeah. You know? So it was impossible to, the cost of that work was impossible possible for us to manage even when we were ma volunteering the time it was yeah. important for us to be earning somewhere yeah. um, so you know it was just too hard yeah so I, we still I still do teacher training programs uh -huh. um, if a school invites me I will go out and do them but it has just become too hard to make that the heart of our work so we're now doing the other things that are easier to do for the like, moment. for example? Like the Peace and Gender Lunchtime Lecture Series, which we've been doing. Um, and these are all virtual because virtual also means there are no costs, virtually no costs anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so we, the, the, the time uh, of the people who are sharing their experience yeah. is a cost, but yes. okay, maybe it's easier to do that in the volunteer realm. I think so. I think that, you know, most of us, us give our time to things because you know uh, this is what we do yeah so, yes but so we were able to do it we were able to work with volunteer speakers mm. so we do that twice a year in mm. September around peace day and then six months later in February as mm. well or four months later I can't count anymore <laughs> but um, we've been doing, running it twice a year and as yeah. you know, we just ran the disarmament toolkit, which yeah. was a pilot. I was, was going to pilot. bring that up. Yeah. Can you please yes. talk about that in detail? I wanted to talk about it because for me, it has been a dream come true. 
Uh -huh. I began, uh, you know, beyond all of the world peace inheritance. I interned at the UN at the Department for Disarmament Affairs when I was 21. And uh, I was just, I mean, it was such a privilege in so many ways, so many ways. And this, uh, I also, the end of college was when Achin Vinayak and Praful Bidbai were setting up the movement in India for nuclear disarmament with a bunch of people from TIFR and the ARCs, you know. And so my friend and I were also the small fry who used to go to the meetings and, you know, I've done, no, but you know, it's important. I think it's, I wish more people would come into movements now in that spirit, yeah. not of somehow bringing something already fully formed, but being willing to be formed by the Absolutely. people they are with. So yeah. I learned so much from hanging out with these people and I will always be grateful, you know, sometimes listening to conversations where I didn't quite understand all the words, yeah. but then yeah. being able to find out. So starting with disarmament and then making other journeys, other ways of looking at peace and security, writing differently. Um, a couple of, when the pandemic started, I thought, you know, why not do these peace and gender series? And my friend Asha Hans at Sanswishti in Bhuvaneshwar and I got together. And so those that series is a partnership. But um, in 2000, I went to a, a con 2001 actually, I went to a conference where um, the Women Waging Peace Conference that year at Harvard. And uh, I, again, I just went in the back to write notes and listen. It's not, I was not a speaker or anything. But there was a woman from South Africa. She'd been part of the anti-apartheid movement as an activist. And now she was a member of parliament. And in her, um, and she said that she had been put on the defense and security committee of parliament. And she said, you know, I'm out of my depth. I never had a chance to learn all this. And I have carried that with me for 20 odd years because I don't think anybody should feel that somehow defense and security issues are not there, uh, are out of their competence or out of their depth. Yeah. Because these decisions affect every one of us. You know, maybe, maybe the decision to by this or that gun is made somewhere else. But when the gun is fired or when the gun is deployed, it is going to be one of us yeah. at the receiving end of it, yeah. right? So I, I believe that we have a right to access that information. And, um, and have a say. I, yeah, and have a say. And have a, and be able to be confident yeah. about it, yeah. which is not to say, you know, I mean, I also have, I also think that there is something to listening and think, hmm, and, but being able to ask the questions, not to out shout the other person, yeah. but to know what questions to ask, to and be able even, to hold think, people accountable. What you're saying, I think that's so important here is to be able to ask a question without diffidence. Yes. You know, and without yes. the fear of being ridiculed. Absolutely. And so the idea with disarmament, and I've been wanting to do something like this, but just didn't know how. But then two, three years ago, just before the pandemic, I went to a meeting that the UN Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in um, Asia and Pacific organized, which was on gun violence and gender. And I thought, you know, this, this is where I began. This is my turf. So why have I waited for this person or that person or that person to be, you know, I can do this. And so we did these series that we figured out the Zoom format. And then I approached my friends at UNRCPD. I said, let's pilot this. Let's put this together, pull our resources, our people together and see how it goes. We had over 600 registrations. Rich. Wow. This do one, people, this recent think workshop. People do. Yes. Uh, do you sorry. think people don't care about the, these issues? They do. Yeah, 600 yeah. registrations, 75 to 100 in the room every day. 
Wow, wow. Uh, sorry, Swarna, can you just spell that out, please? The UN body. Uh, you mentioned the UN the body. UN Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in Asia and the Pacific. UNRCPD. It's in Kathmandu. Um, so this is an amazing number of people, as you reported, uh, Swarna, just now, who mm -hmm. have shown an interest in and actually attended this workshop. What are what are you picking up? What are some of the values or concerns or anxiety that are evoking this interest in 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 peace and in the whole disarmament uh, sphere? I think uh, people are just very, I think post the Russia Ukraine thing, my sense is people are very anxious. Uh, there's more interest uh, because of that concern mm. in understanding things like uh, nuclear doctrine, nuclear vocabulary. And I think certainly the, the pandemic has made people interested in biological warfare. So yeah. uh, I think that this some of that, that persists, I huh? also think because it was a UNRCPD course, I also think it was a little aspirational that, you know, this is a course that will help me learn something further my uh, prospects. And um, we also had a few people who work in the field. Mm -hmm. So for us as well, I mean, we may be organizers of the course, but for all of us, listening to experts talk about these issues was a chance in a lifetime. You know? yeah. So it was, I, I think it was all of that, that was the un, it was all of that together. But I think that what it shows is that if we open these doors, people will come and learn. You know, we make a lot of elitist assumptions, even as we speak a radical politics, we make assumptions about what is important to people. Yeah. What is um, of concern to them, what is of interest to them, what will be too difficult. Those are all our assumptions. Well, there is also an element of uh, what is assumed in the framework of uh, so-called popular culture. And mm -hmm. in, for example, because I'm told this all the time, uh, nonviolence is supposed to be boring. Yeah. It's assumed to be. It's supposed uh, to be boring. It's also so like almost wimpy, which is which it isn't, of course, but yeah, all of that. Yeah. I agree. Okay. It's not part of the, and particularly now, I think uh, we're looking at a very, we're looking at an age that valorizes a certain degree of aggression as, as uh, agency you know yeah but you know there's a huge paradox here uh, swarna because see uh, the ability to physically fight uh, and and win over and against some either another individual or a whole mm -hmm. uh, tribe or a whole nation this has been glamorized throughout history actually mm -hmm. Maybe what is different now is that uh, the arrival of, of uh, the audiovisual technology, you mm -hmm. know, starting with the earliest slow moving films mm -hmm. in the early 1900s, uh, that has given a new twist to the whole human experience because now you're able to depict uh in ways that you know was not it didn't have the same effect when it was a painting or a statue or something mm -hmm. so there is that but the irony is that actually this is the same period the 20th century and now the two decades into this century when uh, there has been more work on nonviolence in a concerted and a very uh a deliberate manner than perhaps any other period in time. So mm -hmm. how do you see this paradox? Because 
it is true that you know more children are growing up on violent games than mm-hmm. on i mean incalculably more children are growing up yeah. on violence based games uh, than on any kind of peace and non violence type of games though those exist so how do you how do you tackle this paradox in your own work and life i have to say uh there are many of these paradoxes that one ends up not quite tackling yeah what about one ends up working on the peace and yeah, yeah right no 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 i'm just sort of say to to be to give an honest answer is sure. to say that i don't actually have an answer and neither because do i is what happens is that in our conversations we we can identify these things but we can only actually handle the piece in front of us absolutely because they are too big and too unmanageable but why but perhaps the reason that more and more people as you say more than ever before in history think about nonviolence now is in fact our own need need to balance this other trend but i think that you know it's not even just the games it's also the um, it's everything it's it's our responses to each other seem sharper angrier you know it's i mean yeah. violence is not just picking up and beating someone right it's also yeah. the it's in our speech um everything i mean there is no mellowness yeah i maybe i'm growing older but i'm beginning to like words like mellow <laughs> gentle you know kind yes much you know that i didn't like them when i was younger i think i always i always knew kind was a really fine thing to be but i think that they're now beginning to acquire a halo because we are not seeing them as much yeah you know we we take naturally gentle children and we discuss them and say he must learn or she must learn to be more aggressive why why can't we have a few yeah. lotuses and roses and asters in our midst why must everyone be you know a, a, a thorn with an yeah. agenda yeah so i mean i i think, I, I think the parents the parents are afraid that the gentle child will be taken advantage of or you know will mm-hmm. be people will write rough shot over this person so sadly uh, making that child more attuned to a aggression oriented <laughs> culture mm-hmm. is seen as part of the kind of you know fitness training that yeah, the yeah. parents the parents feel they have to give uh, see this is uh, let me uh, put on record here the most basic way in which we saw this change when i was a kid and i'm past 60 now so it was really a long time ago we were told okay if there is an altercation in the park or in the school room or you know anywhere else with other children and somebody hits you you don't hit them back you you tell the nearest grown up and the teacher or a parent or an uncle or an auntie and they will handle the situation now for the last 30 odd years i have seen in household after household the exact opposite being taught to children that yeah. uh, in fact the parents will i've even seen the child get scolded because the parent says what so you didn't hit the child back you didn't hit that person back and you came home crying yeah, yeah. why and how this changed i am not qualified to say yeah but but do you see this as a reality that you have to deal with in in the work you try to do i i do see it i do think i mean working with children is still the most hopeful because you we haven't quite stamped the viciousness into them mm. uh, we haven't quite transformed them you know we tend to work with 6 7 standard children when we go to a school because we um, the older kids are tied up with board exams and we don't 
this is an easier entry point for us. They're old enough not to be very easily triggered by serious conversations and young enough to be open to different ways of thinking. But um, within them, there is actually a more instinctive understanding of things we speak about. Mm -hmm. And I often say when I'm teaching college students, walking into uh, schools, we used to begin with this session, what is peace? which was supposed to be like this big dramatic show is it peace is this and peace is that. And, and we would say, what is peace? And the kids would come back with peace is a sense of calm. And at that point, I, each time I narrate this, I also think, okay, how, how fraudulent is my claim to be a peace educator when a 10 year old gets it immediately? Peace is who you are inside. Mm. And you are saying that repeatedly, huh? That that is the default. I'm uh, saying that with younger kids. I see it much less with uh, anyone who is eligible to vote. Huh. I see everything with kids. You still see it. Kids still have an instinctive sense of right and wrong, um, mm. of what compassion means, being kind to each other, mm. and that's um, that actually makes peace education happy work. Hmm. You know, they yeah. immediately yeah. They, you know, they get sunshine, trees, yeah. happy yeah. children playing in the park. Because this question, what is peace, is often our entry point. When we do, we've hmm. done, we did an art activity uh, hmm. just a month before the pandemic in with a group of children where we said, okay, we bought lots of chart paper colors. Hmm. And we talked a little bit about what peace could mean. And we said, draw. Hmm. And this is, you know, they know, they know. So we don't have to give them a lecture on this. Mm. But we forget, as we grow older, we forget these fundamentals. You know, we get drawn into um, a, all kinds of competition, all kinds of conflict, mm. you know. And then we, we, we get rooted in our positions. Yeah. So that so one of the questions we get very often is, how do you do dialogue? How can I have a conversation with people who disagree with me? Yeah, so that's one of the exercises that you run. So in this yeah. context, it must be even more heartening to see how many people signed up for the peace and disarmament workshop, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. And what are what is what are you what are some of the signals you are picking up? By the way, what was the age profile? Do you have an, any idea? Was it was it mostly young people? Uh, my sense is it was people from about nineteen twenty to maybe people in their fifties. Okay. okay, they were also all over from all over the world because we hadn't, oh. you know, there was no way we could close it off. We picked a time okay. that would be somewhat good for everybody, four to seven India time. And we had people from as far west as Winnipeg in Canada and Melbourne in Australia. So okay. it's like two okay. ends of the world. Lots of people from South Asian towns, small mm. towns mm. across the region, not mm. just the metros. So I think, you know, it just was... Did India-Pakistan so as an issue did. come up at all in this workshop? No, no, because because we had very dry technical lectures. And unfortunately, one of the flaws in our pilot design was that we crammed a lot in, the common mm -hmm. flaw. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really have open spaces mm -hmm. where people could get into those conversations. But you know, in, in other things, like when WRN runs their Women, Peace and Security course, then there is a lot of room for those oh, Sorry, you will have to spell and out WRN. Have, WRN is? Uh, the Women's Regional Network, of which also I'm a member, okay. uh, runs a Women, Peace and Security course okay. uh, every year, every other year. And that has primarily Afghan, Pakistani and Indian uh, participants. And those conversations tend to get much more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This was really very technical, you know, from what is this weapon? What is the difference between this kind and that kind, what are the regimes? Yeah. So it so was in, intended yeah, but, to be technical. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in closing, uh, Sona, how, uh, how do you, uh, 
uh, see this phenomenon of many young people today that I meet. Now, of course, that's a bit of a self-selected group, I suppose. Uh, but I like to imagine that I don't live in quite so much of a, you know, a tower or a uh, or in isolation, I, I I think, especially since I get to go to schools and colleges sometimes in the pre-pandemic time, I think it's a fairly wide range of young people. I find lots of them have a kind of post-nationalist sensibility. And yeah. the idea of, you know, this conflict between, say, India and Pakistan or uh, uh, other countries, others, other such binaries, they find it quite ridiculous and wasteful. And yet yeah. they feel daunted about what they can do. So mm -hmm. what, what are some of the insights that you could share? Now this, and I would request you to do this at two levels, what they can do in their own life. Because as you said, at the end of the day, it is what is immediate and in front of you doing something about it that gives you satisfaction. Mm -hmm. and otherwise, you you know you just get lost in the... So yeah. both in terms of the macro and the immediate, what, what you can do in your own life, what are some of the insights that you could share that, you know, as inspiration if, mm -hmm. or advice with these young people? I think one of the things that, uh, uh, whether I'm teaching or I'm in one of our peace education programs, so giving a talk, one of the things I want to keep telling people, reminding them is that they have agency mm. and that they have a right to act. They are citizens, you know, this is a very big thing. And um, I cannot stress enough yeah. that citizenship is a right and an entitlement yeah. that you exercise. So yeah. it, you, you don't need anybody's permission to become aware, to be better informed, to ask questions. Mm. And to actively deal with any sense of helplessness that you're feeling. Because that is the main... Yes, but the moment you start doing these three, the helplessness yeah. diminishes. Because then the next step is how do you talk about these things? Yeah. And... I think the first step to talking about anything is to listen to other people. Mm -hmm. So to learn to listen to the opinions you think are obnoxious, you know, without, I mean, just let people speak. You want to have your say, let them have their say. Mm -hmm. Then ask them, engage with them. You can engage Socratically, you can ask questions. If you keep asking questions with a genuine spirit of inquiry, they will come, they will find their own contradictions. They will find their own ways to qualify what they think are absolute truths. I'm fairly sure of that. Uh, that's my conviction that allows me to engage with this exercise. Um, if you think somebody is beyond redemption, move on. You cannot change everybody. And I keep telling young people, pick your battles. We live in times where you can't be quixotic. You can't fly at everything that looks at a windmill. You can't be outraged about everything. Um, I think it is important, for example, if you are a student, I think it is important also to study. You are mm. not responsible for all the problems of the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. Get, get the studies out of the way That's be right. qualified to stand up in a conversation and feel confident to then engage pick the lines of study and work that are in line with your values you know do all of that but at a particular stage that is your duty and i think that that matters yeah because you don't want to be you don't you want to be you want to be strategic also about your life. Yeah. Your life is of no use if you're just scattering your energies here and there. That's right. So channel them. Skill That's yourself. True. Yeah. Yeah. Learn. You know, I think your point about outrage is very important because uh, we live also in a time when there is a kind of subtle encouragement 
to think, to believe that if you are sufficiently passionately outraged, that you have done something. Yeah, correct. That, you know, the more you are uh, angry about something, the more committed you are. Uh, whereas what most situations require is concerned action. Yes. Even if the action is the tiniest of the tiniest kind, um, and uh, and rage in any case, however it may come upon us. I mean that there's an involuntary element to it, of course. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, in a sense, you know, one never becomes unshockable. Yeah. But uh, you know, in somebody had actually put this on the wall in Sevagram Babu Kuti. It was a handwritten little cardboard sign. Somebody at the ashram must be doing this from time to time, taking Gandhi's quotations and hanging them because the world passes through that kuti every day. Okay, It said, when you are in the right, you can afford to hang on to your temper. When you are in the wrong, you can't afford to lose it. So true. So true. Yeah. true. Yeah. But also, there is an element uh, that I worry about, you know, the, the sense of absolute certainty mm. when you are outraged or when you are angry about something that I am right. You know, I am, I know it. This is the way, this is the vocabulary, yeah. this is the framing. Yeah. Everything that went before yeah. is flawed. Yeah. is a misstep. I think that what we forget in that moment of absolute certainty, which is something I believe we should shun in any case, is that we will also be deemed flawed tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is a journey, right? Yeah. We yeah, are not absolutely. perfectly formed snapshots. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're not plasticine models. No. We are human beings on a journey together. Yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah. there will always be some, we will, we are learning. So I may say one sentence correctly and one sentence that I've spoken today may be completely off the wall ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But, the, it, but, but that doesn't I define you. That that one no, sentence doesn't define you or anyone. This is the moment in our life, yeah. in our journey. It, it, you know, right. where we're talking together. So I think that the when even as we talk about different kinds of inclusion and sensitivity, peace is also about saying, "Ah, oh, she said that." Okay, that's it. It's those are only words. They only become big when you blow them up. That's you one. don't like so, something somebody's doing. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. when I when I was talking about outrage or just rage and grief a few moments ago, I wasn't actually thinking about the battles of ideas, but of physical events. Uh, mm -hmm. Because and we are have you know when uh, and not only that something horrific is done to a person. Who, you know, in, in the way they are killed, mm -hmm. but that the perpetrator then also takes a video and themselves shares, puts the video out. Yes. You know, um, these are things which are um, at the raw act itself um, is, uh, you know, not something that can be debated. It's not, it's not an opinion that one can you know agree or disagree with no. it is so it and a lot of young people that i uh, and actually even people my own age uh, are tending to you know almost go into a depressive mode uh, with these incidents i mean including that one the latest one that you know yes, that happened yes. the the beheading in udaipur um, and um, how does, you know, so I think it's a, many groups, many individuals and certainly communities of friends and um, uh, fraternal communities are, are helping each other to process this. 
but uh, you know, I, I, what I'm struggling with is to see how many people are able to see the raw problem of violence in that situation. And you know, not respond to that incident of violence in in a us and them sense. That is, I, I yeah, most... I don't think we're. I think our our sensibilities, sensitivities, have been so messed up brutalized even i don't be brutalized i don't think we can even i don't think we're, we're in a position to do what you're saying i mean if we're in a i if you and i and we do this work with some conviction and uh I want to say discipline because we get up and do this every day. If we are not able to find, no, you know, as opposed to in it, if we're not able to find, I don't have the words, Rajni. Have I written about this? I don't have the words because what are the words? No, there aren't. I, in, yeah, there aren't. In, in Hindi, we have the right term for some, you know, what we are experiencing. Ki ye hai. Exactly. exactly. To say that it leaves us speechless is a very poor translation, but that's the closest. It's no, but it, it's actually a really good word. Yes. That's and it's also that where I think then for me when something is unspeakable yeah, I think then that I need to find some entry point to, to make it a teachable moment, to make it a moment of reflection, a moment of learning. And that's the entry point into change. But that change, this moment is the product of many years of many unresisted changes. We are like this because we have let many other things pass without pushing back or, or, or without bringing another truth to them. Um, how long will it take for us to make? I think that that is actually the hard part one of the hard things about peace education work or peace work of any sort, the time that it takes, mm. it is it is again and talking about slow work. It is slow work. If the peace is to be lasting, then the peace work will take time, yeah. including a situation like this where we can't find the words and we can bring, barely bring ourselves to speak with each other because we may not have the heart or the stomach for the conversation that follows. Yeah. You know? And all of our regular uh, uh, tools appear to be out of our hands. So yeah. there is a, there is, it, it is easy to feel despair. The only thing that, that I fall back on is that to give in to the despair is the ultimate defeat. Yes. We feel it. Uh, it is a reality. And this, it, it's not a question of being in denial of what one is mm -hmm. feeling. But at the same time, if we don't resist that, the, the, that downward and the, and the way to resist it, I think, is yeah. to remember how many people uh, are working on how many things at this Absolutely. moment. At, as we speak, people are push, pushing back against all kinds of discrimination. They're pushing back to make sure that people have wells. 
people have water, that schools have benches and teachers. Yeah. That corona vaccines yeah. are reaching people. Yeah. The if you if you start counting on the other side, all of the good things that people are doing in yes. the world. Yes, yes. Then it is easy to put your heart there, get a little energy, come back and do your own little good thing. Wonderful. Yeah. I think that's a that perfect. Take heart and hope from each other. We do. We do. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect moment for us to. Thank you for having me, Rajni. No, I no, feel thank so you. Privileged. No, thank you, dear. It's an honor, and I'm so glad you made the time. And we will be in touch more. Definitely. Definitely. Take care.